I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on
Praise the Lord for his word standing forever. I'm glad we get to study it this morning. Everything that was written when it was written is still true today, and it's still going to be true, I say, a thousand years from now, but forever. So his word is settled forever. We don't have to worry about it ever changing. It's good. Uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to look in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 6, which happened a long time ago, and it's still true today as well. So we're going to keep studying that. I'm looking forward to it. I like this series on Nehemiah and what we can learn about just the rebuilding of a city and the rejuvenating of a city and all of the things that are occurring here. And last week, we kind of got to the place where the city was about to, the walls of the city and the gates were about to be set up. And we're going to pick up there today in Nehemiah in chapter 6 and verse 15. And then we're going to do read down to chapter 7 and verse 7. And then we're going to jump down a few verses and read a little more. So if you would stand with me as we read the word of the Lord together. I kind of wonder sometimes if we're going to get to it shortly here in the book of Nehemiah, not today, but if we stood to read from morning until noon, how many people would stay? I don't think a lot of people, so we're not going to try that, but I just, I've kind of wondered that from time to time. I wonder if I would stay. That would be a long time to stand and read. So um, anyway, all right, Nehemiah chapter six and verse 15 down to chapter seven and verse seven says this, so the wall was finished in the 20 and fifth day of the month Elul in 50 and two days. And it came to pass when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son, Johanan, had taken the daughter of Melshom, Melsholem, the son of Berechiah. Also they reported his good deeds before me, and uttered my words before him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Now it came to pass, when the wall was built, and I set up the doors, and the porters, and the singers, and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Hanani, and Hananiah, ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man, and feared God above many. And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot, and while they stand by, let them shut the doors, and bar them, and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, every one in his watch, and every one to be over against his house." Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not builded. But my God put it into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them, which came up at the first and found written therein. These are the children of the province that went up out of, cap- out of the captivity of those that had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and came again to Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, who came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Remiah, uh, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, Bigvi, Nahum, uh, Banna, The number I say of the men of this people of Israel was this, and he goes on and he lists a whole lot of people. But jump down to verse 57 with me. It says, And the children of Solomon's servants, the children of Sotai, the children of Sophereth, the children of Peredah, the children of Jela, the children of Darkon, the children of Gidil, the children of Sephatiah, the children of Hittil, the children of Pachareth, the children of Zebaim, the children of Ammon, the children and all the Nethanims, and the children of Solomon's servants were 390 and two. And these were they which went up also from Tel Mela, Tel Harisha, Cherub, Adon, and Emmer, but they could not show their father's house nor their seed, whether they were of Israel. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nakoda, 642. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for your word. I ask now, Lord, that you would just help me to expound upon the truths that are contained in this book of Nehemiah. Help me to articulate the things that you would have each person in here to to hear today, Lord God. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would just work through me. I ask that the Holy Spirit would work on each heart and mind today to find the things that you would have them to understand and to apply them to their lives. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Babylon was leveled basically at the end of 2 Chronicles or 2 Kings. They both end with the same account of how um, Jerusalem is finally destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuzar Adon and all the things that they do. They demolish the walls and they carry away the final group of people into captivity. 
And at that point, God tells them that the land is going to have rest for her Sabbaths for 70 years. And so for 70 years, the people of Israel are going to remain in bondage in Babylon and then eventually under the hands of the Medes and the Persians. And Jerusalem is going to lie in waste not having Hebrews there. There are other people that are going to be sent into the land by the various kings who are over them. But at the same time, the people of Israel, the Israelites, are primarily are removed. And at this time, they have decimated the walls and they did a pretty thorough job of leveling everything in the city and or burning it. But now, as time has passed, 70 years um, go by, and under um, King Cyrus, the first group of people was allowed to go back under Zerubbabel. And then a little while later, several, actually many years later, um, Artaxerxes allows Ezra to go back, and then he allows Nehemiah to go back, both with different groups of people. And so, after 70 years, the land was finally inhabited again, but it was about another 70 years during the time where Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah all came back in different waves. And during that 70 years, that second 70 years, the city of Jerusalem remained pretty desolate. The walls had not been rebuilt and the gates were burned and a lot of the buildings were still destroyed. And over time, they were gradually and had at this point rebuilt the temple. But essentially, it was 140 years from the time that the um, walls were torn down until they're rebuilt. So it's 140 years roughly from the time that Nebuzar Adon laid waste to the walls in Jerusalem until the time when Nehemiah comes back to rebuild the walls. And as we've studied and read thus far, it's incredible what God did with one man who has fully surrendered to his will. Nehemiah heard about the destruction in Israel and he said, God, I have a prayer. God, I want you to work through me. I want you to use me to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And God used one man to put this all in motion. And one man was able to go and talk to the king and the king gave him the desires of his heart to rebuild the city. God was able to use one man who was fully dedicated to him. And this one man, he returns to Jerusalem and he has the king's backing and the king's goods and he goes and he views the city and this one man tells the city, this is what is in my heart. This is what God's put on my heart. This is what God has done for me and this is what God is doing for us. And from that moment, 52 days is all it takes to build the wall. 52 days. It sat desolate for 140 years, and in 52 days, they built a wall. And this isn't a small wall. Most things I've read say it's about at least three meters wide, and the height varies by what you read. But even if it's three meters wide and a foot tall, that is a big project to undertake in 52 days. They are going around an entire city. And they get through that all, And the work is done, and that's where we start out in chapter 6. The work is complete. We see, so the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month of Elul in 50 and 2 days. And you read that, and you're like, Nehemiah did it. He built the walls. He's finished it. He's accomplished his goal. But you look at Nehemiah, and he said, no, there's more to do. The, The city is physically secure. Yes, we have a wall. And now he's going to set to a new task. And his new task is going to be this. Not only do they have a wall, he wants a security plan. He wants to make sure that they are keeping the bad people out and the good people in. And the protection is meant to be for the benefit of God's people within the walls. And so we see in the first few verses of chapter 7, he begins setting up men to institute his plans. We have Hananiah and Hananiah, and they are going to oversee the security of the city. And so he says, look, I want you to set the watches. I want you to make sure we have people that are by their houses and their house is close to their section of the wall. They can go up on the wall and maybe they march like sentries around the top of it. I don't know. Um, But they're, they're the lookouts. They're seeing, is somebody coming? Is there a war coming? Is there a battle coming? Is there something we need to do? And so he sets those people up for security and they're out and they're looking for it. And then he says, and here's what else we're going to do. We're only going to let the gates be open when the sun is hot. So people aren't coming into our city at night. There's not going to be any of these Trojan horse type things going on. We're going to keep the bad people out and the good people in. And people can come in and trade during the day. But when it's night, they got to go. This is our city. We're going to protect it. And so he begins working on this plan and he has this desire to secure the city. And as he's working through it in verses one through four, he's laying out the plan and telling the people what to do. And it's a large city and the people there are few. And he says, this is what we're going to do. This is great. This is wonderful. And we get to verse five and God says, yeah, your plan's good, but I got something better that we need to do. He says, there's a little more to your plan. You want to be secure, but then you get to verse five and it says, and as he's working on this, and my God put it into mine heart 
to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them, which came up at the first and found written therein. And then he begins to go through the genealogies once again. And so you think very practically about what's going on. We think about Nehemiah. He is concerned with his city. He wants Jerusalem just to be God's chosen people. He wants it to thrive. He wants God to continue to build it. So he goes and under God's grace and with God's power and help, they build the walls. And the walls are built now. And he's saying, now we have to keep those people out. Those are the people that are trying to hurt us. Those are the people that are trying to destroy us. We have to keep them out. What can we do? We can set up guards. That'll let us see if they're coming in. We'll keep the gates closed. We'll know if they're coming in. I'll put up faithful, godly men that will report on these things. And God says, why don't you look what's inside first? God says, I I want you to, yes, the security is important. And you're looking at all of the outward things. You're looking at the people trying to come in. But he says, and God put it in my heart to gather all of these people together. And let's check the genealogies. Let's see if the people inside of the walls are the people that are supposed to be here. Let's see who is inside of our city. Let's see what exactly is going on. Because no amount of protection is going to do good from the outside if we have something that is destroying from the inside. And we think about cars and we're going to drive and we're going to wear our seat belts and we're going to do all these things. If you never go to the doctor and you have cancer, the seat belt's not going to do you any good. We got to worry about what's on the inside. There's something inside of us that can destroy us. And we have a very good analogy for the Christian life today as we read through this. Very often we're concerned about the outside. What is my school, what is the school teaching my children? Or what am I hearing at work? Or what's on my television? Or what's on, in all of these different situations. What's the world trying to do to me? And God's saying, why don't we take a look at the inside before we worry about the outside? And this morning we see two areas, two main points that I think we get from Nehemiah on the things that we need to look to on the inside if we're going to continue to be secure, if we're going to continue to go forward, if we're going to continue to be built up and have God's blessings. And so the first thing we see is in chapter 6 and verses 17 through 19, the walls are built, the gates are set up, it's complete. And before we ever get to what God's saying, we see like this precursor and I believe a reason why God is saying you need to look on the inside. In verse 17, it says, Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. And there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, the son of Johanan, and had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Now I'm going to explain very practically what's going on here because we've got a lot of names going on, but this is basically what's happening. We have Nehemiah who's over all of Jerusalem. He is the governor. He's been put in charge there. He is um, the chief poobah of the area, um, if that's the right word. So that's his section. He has that. He has Judah basically is what he has. Jerusalem is his city. And then outside of that, we have Tobiah over the Ammonites and we have um, Sanballat and we have Geshem over the Arabians and we have all of these different guys. But in these verses in chapter 7, or in verses 17 through 19, we see Tobiah. Tobiah is the head of the Ammonites. And as you're reading here, we read about the nobles of Judah, and they're sending letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah is sending letters to them, and they're talking good about Tobiah, but they're telling Nehemiah what's going on. But what's going on here, if you want to think about it from a very practical standpoint, is this. Tobiah is a governor of his own area, and as governor, he wants more power. And it tells us that Tobiah is the son-in-law of Shechaniah. And the reason it tells us this by implication is that Shechaniah is a Jew. He is a man who would be within the walls of Jerusalem. He would be of Jewish lineage. And so Tobiah engages in a political alliance through marriage. This was very prominent back during those times and in some places of the world today. People still arrange marriages among their children because it has a political or perhaps wealth ramifications. And so what we have here is Tobiah, he's marrying a Jew because he wants a political alliance because he wants Jerusalem. He's not content with just having the people of Ammon. He wants to have two areas. He wants to grow his power and his authority. And so he marries this Hebrew and he's going to use it for political purposes. But then he takes his son, who would be a half Ammonite and half Hebrew, and he has his son marry the daughter of Meshullam, another Jew. And so we see 
Again, what Tobiah is doing here is he's trying to make inroads in his authority within Jerusalem. So he's marrying whoever it takes. And he marries his son off to whoever it takes. He wants the power. He wants the authority. And so he is developing relationships and alliances. He's being polit politically expedient. He's doing what people do all over the world every single day. And it really shouldn't surprise us. And so he's cultivating and developing his influence, and he's using that influence to try now to destabilize Jerusalem from within. Judah, or Judah, Nehemiah is the rightful governor over all of Judah, but Tobiah wants to be. And now we have Nehemiah examining the city, and he's saying, what are the security pitfalls? And he's looking to the outside, and God says, you need to look inside first. And inside the gates, we have these various people who are starting to cause problems. We have the nobles from within who are discussing things, are writing letters to Tobiah. And Tobiah is writing letters to him. And then they are going to Tobiah and saying, look, this is what Nehemiah is doing. And they're writing, or Tobiah's writing letters to the nobles and they're saying, hey, Nehemiah, Tobiah's this great guy. He's awesome. And you start to see that we have the people who are sworn to Tobiah are starting to try to tear down Nehemiah from within. I mean, you think just practically, again, how it's working. Nehemiah's governor, people are coming to him and like, man, that ruler over there of Ammon, he's a good guy. He's great. Did you see all the things he's doing? Look how he's building. And then they're writing letters back to Tobiah saying, this Nehemiah, I can't believe what he's doing. I mean, he is wrecking this place. He, and, and they're writing everything. They're taking his words and probably misconstruing them and changing them in all sorts of ways. And they're sending him back to uh, Tobiah. And what we see here is kind of practically what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. We see this idea of criticism start to come in to tear people down. They're criticizing Nehemiah by saying, look, Tobiah is doing it better than you are. Look, could, could you just be like Tobiah? Look what he's doing. He's got it right. And then we're just going to tell Tobiah what you're doing. You're, you're not the leader we need. You messed this up and you messed that up and you've done this wrong. And, you done, and we think of the, the saying, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We've probably all heard that. But the truth is, words hurt. Yes. And we got Nehemiah here and Nehemiah is trying to oversee this city and he's trying to set it up and he's trying to get it back to where God wants it to be. And yet God says there's a problem within, and that problem within is coming from this group of people, and this group of people is trying to tear you down, and the thing that is most likely to destabilize your central government is a critical spirit. And you think about our lives and how true that is. A critical spirit can destroy more than any battering ram from the outside. A critical spirit tears people down. A critical spirit hurts people. And we'll get to what it does more in a minute, but just think about what a critical spirit is. This is a definition by me, so I didn't find it anywhere. I just wrote my own, I guess. Um, it says the, ad I saw several of them. I just didn't like them. I liked mine better. So uh, <laughs> the attitude or mindset that causes one to think or focus on the shortcomings or problems of another or a situation. It's that attitude where I don't want to think about what's wrong with me. I want to think about what's wrong with you. I, maybe we can identify it in our own lives by a series of questions. And I think any one of these, if, it's, if you say yes to it, you're probably struggling with a critical spirit. Do you criticize and pass judgment on others? I mean, that one's a pretty clear sign, right? Like, hey, you have this problem in your life. If you enjoy doing that, you have a critical spirit. Do you find yourself in conversation saying negative things more often than, po more often than positive things? Uh, do you rather, would you rather direct a, attack on somebody or would you rather lift somebody up? Would you rather say something negative or something positive? Do you always question rather than giving the benefit of the doubt? I think that's becoming a problem with trust in society, but at the same time, as Christians, we're to love people and we're to lift people up. And if I'm questioning everybody at all times, that may be starting to point to some things in my life. Do you feel it's your job to correct people? Like, you feel like that's my job. My calling in life, if I have one calling in life, it's to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> Out of the number of sentences that you have spoken this morning, how many have been in complaint in some way? Um, pick a person. Think about the last few conversations you've had with them. How many have been uplifting and how many have been critical? 
And we can just think about these things in our lives. Um, and I think any one of them starts to point to a critical spirit. But here's my final one. If right now you're criticizing this list, <laughs> yeah, just think about it. And then we can break down critical people or these people with critical spirits into different classifications. Um, and I didn't write a definition, so who knows how long I'll talk about each of these. But just think about it. Well, first, we have the gossiper, right? The gossiper is a, criti- uh, is a person who has a critical spirit. Because the gossiper wants to go to you and say, hey, did you know this about Miss Crystal? Miss Crystal, look, she doesn't want me to say anything, but you know what I mean? It's that person. Like, they just want to say, look, there's a problem with her. It, I'm telling you it because we need to pray about her. She needs a lot of prayer. Pray with me. And so we have the gossiper. Then we have the slanderer. We got the person who likes to lie about people, right? And we probably all know these people. And they're like, hey, let me tell you about this situation. And they tell you all about it. And then you find out later that nothing they said is true. And we, I'm guessing all know these people. Like I can, having been a youth pastor for as long as I was, I got a lot of these. And having been an attorney, I think I have even more because... People will lie to you as an attorney, which I don't understand because I'm going to help you in court. And people like, they tell you bold-faced lies and they want you to defend it. And then they're on the witness stand and the other attorney asks them, did you? Yes, I did. And I'm sitting over here like, what? Like you told me, no, you lied to me. What is your, and that's not slander, but this is just me going off on a tangent. But we think of those type of people. Those are the type of people that are like, they're willing to say anything just to make themselves look good. And often what they do is to make themselves look good as they try to talk bad about somebody else. And so they slander them. Did you know how bad of a person? Did you know that they did this? Did you, do you know who they are? And we think of the slanderers. And then we have the judgmental person. This is probably the chief critic, I don't know. Um, the judgmental person is the one who just, you know, you say something to them and they want to tell you how wrong you are for having that thought, right? Um, and we can think of this in all sorts of situations too. I'm trying to think of an example that's, I'm not going to put my foot in my mouth. Um, but I, I think my wife's just saying, don't talk. She's shaking her head. No. Um, but I mean, all sorts of ways. People come to you and they want to tell you, you know, look, I need to talk to you about this problem. First of all, they're confessing and they're looking for your advice and you're going to sit there and rip their face off. Look, they, they don't need your critical spirit. They need your prayer and they need your help and they need your love. And we want to criticize people. And there's the judgmental person. Then there's the hater. Um, I don't have a better way of explaining it. Just the person who hates everything, right? Uh, Those are very critical people. Hey, let's do this. That's so stupid. Why do we have to do that? I hate that. Like, we're going here today. I don't want to go there today. I hate that. This is what we're having for lunch. Really? We had that yesterday. Uh, You know what I mean? And it's over and over and over. And there's people like that. They're right in line with the complainer, the hater and the complainer. They, They go hand in hand. And then we have the nitpicker. Um, and the most interesting thing about a nitpicker is where the term comes from. I mean, a person with lice and the lice leaves behind the nit, right? And you have to open the hair and you're slowly pulling out the little eggs from those louse, right? And you're getting them one by one by one. That's what a nitpicker is, right? They're that person that like, they see that little thing and they're like, I'm going to pick at it. And I just want to get it like they're getting a little lice out of somebody's hair, a little louse out of somebody's hair, right? And it's gross. And people that are like this are gross. Um, yeah, it just, it is. It, you, nobody likes the nitpicker. They want to find the finest, you know what I mean? You go through, like I stand up here and read the Bible and I mess up a word and somebody's like, did you know you messed up that word today? Shut up. Um, but you're not allowed to say that because you're the pastor. My wife looked at me like, you're not allowed to say that because you're the pastor. And I'm not. I apologize. It, it, it did come out. But, um, but at the same time, the, the nitpicker, like, stop picking nits and go do something useful with your time. Uh, then we have the stockpiler. The stockpiler is the person who wants to collect every bad thing you've ever done. And once they get the stockpile, they want to blow up on you, right? They get it and they're like, oh, yeah? Pastor R, do you remember in 1994 when you preached this? And then in 1968, you said this. And then uh, if you go back, I remember your wife told me this. And like all of a sudden, they want to blow up like everything ever in the history of the world. And you're like, all of this time, all you've been doing is thinking about all these negative things about me. Could you not just put them aside and live your life? But that's, that's the stockpiler, and people do this. And then there's the one I call the subtle jabber. The one that like, you're talking and like, they just want to like, make that little poke at you every time, right? Um, just, I, I don't have a good example of this either, but I, I think we all 
we know what we're talking about, right? You, you say something and they're that person who's like, ah, I got you. There's the one little zinger, I, I don't know, one-liners, whatever. And what's incredible is we can do this with a smile on our face. Oh, I was just joking, really? Why were you thinking about it at all? And a critical spirit does this. A critical spirit gets inside of us and it kind of becomes who we are if we're not careful. We become those people who are really good at tearing people down or tearing arguments down or tearing situations down or tearing projects down or tearing ideas down. But that's all we ever do. And it causes problems. And as you look around our country, you'll see this problem of a critical spirit is very evident. We see people everywhere criticizing people for everything. I mean, that's really broad, right? Everyone's criticizing somebody for something. But that's kind of what it seems like. And it's developed to a place in our country to where it's like we have these factions of criticizing people. We can't have open dialogue anymore. There's no debate. There's no discussion. Either you're with me or I'm going to rip you apart. And there's not often much substance to the arguments. Usually it seems like whoever yells the loudest or the longest. And now we have people perpetrating violence on one another in our country because they don't like what they're saying. I mean, you watch some of these school board meetings that are going on around town for uh, critical race theory or for immunizations or for wearing face masks. These people all lost their ever-loving minds. Yeah. I don't know where they went, but you know, have one side and the other side, and all of a sudden we have brawls going on and people being carried out in handcuffs. And while it makes for good TV to watch, it's an absolute sad place that our country has come to. Yeah, amen. It's destroying lives. And yet it's not just destroying society. It's destroying people. It's tearing people down. And you look at the critical spirit from a practical standpoint, and the first thing it does is it tears people down. Sometimes we want to say, oh, I'm helping them, right? I just, they just need my help. I'm just trying to do good for them. or I, They need to know what's wrong with them. But what we're doing is tearing people down. If what you are sharing is helping them to overcome a sin, great. But if not, why are you saying it? I think about Luke in chapter 17. If, let's look there together. Luke in chapter 17, verse 1. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 down to verse 3. Says this, then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Let's read a little more. And if you trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn to thee again, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now think about that. Jesus is saying, it's impossible but that offenses will come, but woe to him through whom they come. And then he says, it were better for a millstone to be hung about your neck and cast into the sea than and you should offend one of these little ones. And then, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if you repent, forgive him. The idea of trespass here is, it's the same word as sin. And as you go through the definition of it, it's really talking about a moral sin against a person. And so, if Christ here is expressing the idea that if somebody has done something pretty awful to you, you need to go to them and rebuke them and restore that relationship. The idea of, you have truly offended me, I need to go to you, or I offended you and I need to go to you, and I need to work that situation out. But if that's not what is going on, then all you're doing is offending a person. We're not to go to people just to criticize them. He says it's impossible that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. Oftentimes we want to say we have good intentions, right? That needed to be said. It's a hard thing and they needed to hear it or, you know, they shouldn't feel offended or I'm trying to help that person or, you know, I, I didn't like it so they needed to know I didn't like it or someone has to say something. But now ask yourself, do you need to offend someone? Is there any reason to offend someone? Because what Jesus says, it's impossible that offenses will come. He says it's going to happen. It's an absolute 100% certainty that people are going to be offended but he says, woe to him through whom they come. Are you the one who's offending people? 
not talking about sinning against them. He's talking about, are you the one criticizing people? Are you tearing people down? Because he says, it is better for you to then take a millstone and hang it about your neck and cast it into the sea than that you offend somebody. That's an interesting choice of words that our Lord uses. It's not our job to criticize people. It's not our job to say, hey, look, your nose hair is too long. It's not our job to say your clothes are ugly, your shoes smell, your breath's bad. It's, it's not our job to say these things. It's not our job to say, look, you messed this up, you messed that up. I mean, if it is your job and you have an employee, then by all means do that. If you're raising a child, yes, it is your job to raise that child. If somebody has a sin in their life, as a Christian, it is our job to go to that person and help them through that sin. But by and large, our job is to love people. Amen. Amen. It's not to criticize people. We are not to offend people. It, I mean, just imagine as Christians, if we were to say some of the things that we say to one another, that we say to people outside of these walls when we're trying to win them to the Lord. We knock on the door and we're like, hey, uh, did you know that your car is parked a little bit too crooked and it just looks stupid? Oh, can I invite you to my church today? What? And yeah, a lot of times in the church, you walk through the church and we hear people talking about people or saying things to people. And you're like, why would I ever listen to you for anything in any regards to any part of the Christian life? Because you're just critical. You're not getting it. And on top of that, people are already hurting. People are broken. Yeah. There's people with financial problems that we don't know about. Right. There's people with health problems that keep it to themselves. There's people who have relationship problems and we know nothing of it. There's people who are hurting for way after way that we cannot possibly understand. And the last thing they need from you is a critical word. Yeah. They don't need you tearing them down. And so Jesus says, look, if that's you, tie a millstone around your neck and throw it into the lake. And he's, you know, not advocating suicide very clearly, but he's making the point, offending another person is a terrible offense in the eyes of our Savior. We're not to be critical. We're to be kind. We're to show love. And your critical spirit has the ability to tear them down. And no, they may never say anything about it. And if you ask them, you know, did that hurt? They probably would never admit it. We need to watch our words. Because our job is to love and not criticize. And when we're critical, we tear other people down. But the other thing a critical spirit does is it tears us down. I think about the most critical people I can think of in my life right now. Um, and that doesn't matter who it is because that's my opinion and you have yours, right? And I'll keep it to myself and you keep yours to you. But, but I think of the people who are hypercritical in my life, they're the most miserable people I know. They seem to not enjoy anything. Um, Sometimes they wear the smile, but you can tell they're broken. And I wonder if they spend so much time focused on the problems of others that they never get to see their own problems, and that's the reason they're as miserable as they are. You think of a kid on a basketball team, right? We pick up, well, if we rebuilt the goal out here, we have like the stump out here and we have the lines. Most people have the goal and no lines. We have the lines and no goal. Um, and so anyway, we go out there to our basketball court with, you know, lines and no goal. And we hang up a, we go original with a milk crate and we cut a hole in the bottom of it. And we get our teams out there and we get all of our, all of our basketball players together. And we're like, let's pick teams. And we get, you know, three on three, four on four, five on five, whatever we're playing. And um, there's always that one guy who wants to say, you're not doing that right. <laughs> we all know this person on a sports team. It does it. If you've ever been on a sports team, there's the guy who can tell you how to do everything right. He's like, uh, you're, uh, your hand's going a little high on the side. That's probably a carry. You need to not dribble the ball like that. And then, you know, you shoot the ball and he's like, your form, that, that's, that, your form's off. Your hands are too close together. Or they're too far apart or, you know what I mean? And they want to criticize something about everything. And then you give them the ball and it's a train wreck. Like, I mean, they're like bouncing the ball with two hands and they're like just shooting granny shots. And you're like, you just told me how to play this game. Like, I realize you're really good at like, you know, NBA, whatever it is at this point on your PlayStation or whatever you're playing it on. And you're probably phenomenal. But when you put a basketball in your hand, it's less than spectacular. And that person's the one who's always got the thing to say. And everybody else is watching this kid play and they're just like, okay, pass me the ball now. You know what I mean? And nobody says anything to him, but he wants to rip everybody apart for how bad they are. It's like he's so focused on what everybody else is doing, he never takes the time to practice, right? He's, he's willing to let everybody else know what they need to practice, but he never puts it into place for himself. 
I think at, back to Lighthouse Baptist Church, where we've spent pretty much, not all of our lives, we've traveled. You guys know most of my story. We've been at different churches, but always going back to Lighthouse, it seems like. I was born there, raised there, and then, you know, went to the Army, came back, went to church there, and then I joined CLA, and then I came back and was a youth pastor there. And um, I, I just, as a son-in-law to the pastor, and seeing the critical things that people said to my pastor right after a service was incredible. Like, sometimes they would come up to me like, hey, uh, Brother Rusty, um, could you tell pastor that the correct past tense of the perfect infinity, I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't have any better grammar than my pastor has. So don't talk to me about this, number one. Number two, focus on the message. Amen. Like, what are you talking about? And they would say these stupidest things to him. I mean, my wife, they've said them to her too. Can you tell your dad this? No, I'm not telling my dad this. If you have a problem with pastor, go talk to pastor. And my favorite thing to do is, oh yeah, you have this problem, let's go talk to pastor. Man, they get real uncomfortable then thinking that I'm gonna lead them all the way to his office. I don't wanna do that to my pastor, so I never take them all the way back there, but they start getting antsy and it's really fun. Um, so, but you, you think about the things that they'll say, like right after service. Uh, pastor, did you know that you were on verse six and you were supposed to be on verse seven? Yep, thank you. I, I, what a blessing you are. <laughs> right? And you consider what they've done. They sat there for a 40-minute message or however long the message is, and they're sitting there, and what are they doing? Pastor messed this up. Pastor messed that up. Pastor, what did you get out of the message? And we wonder why these people with a critical spirit aren't growing. It's because they're not even listening. They're not trying to apply anything to themselves. They're just saying... Oh, he's got a problem here and she's got a problem there. I, I think about my teens again in the youth group. We go to camp and you hear this like a phenomenal message. You hear this pastor, he's ripping face and it's perfect and it's right for the teenagers. And he's telling them, you know, you're a sinner in this way and that way and every way. And, you know, I'm sitting there under conviction and everybody's under conviction and they have the invitation and half the kids go forward and I'm going forward. We're all praying. And right afterwards, the teen comes up to me. He's like, Brother Rusty, that teen really needed that. Are you kidding me right now? They did probably, but so did you. Why were you paying attention to them the whole time? And we're so focused on what other people need when we have a critical spirit that we tear ourselves down because we never take the time to apply it to ourselves and say, hey, just what is the truth that God is trying to teach me right now? And because of that, we fell as Christians. Yes. Amen. Amen. We destroy ourselves. It applies in every facet of life. I mean, we are quick to judge others. We're quick to blame them for our problems. Crystal, that's your fault. You know, it's my, Crystal's, you know, she's, I can just lay all my blame on her. She's my wife, right? It's your fault today, Crystal. But what does that teach me? Nothing. It teaches me to blame shift. And when we do that, we criticize other people, we tear them down, and we never grow. And so there's a huge problem with the critical spirit. Turn to Matthew chapter 7 with me, if you would. Here we get to see the solution to a critical spirit. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 4 says this, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote that is in, out the mote out of thine eye, somebody will probably come correct me now, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Uh, and you think about that, and look what Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't judge someone else, or you're going to be judged likewise. Again, think about this idea of a critical spirit. You're, you're setting the standard in somebody's life. You're saying, look, you are wrong for this, you're wrong for that, you've done this. And Jesus says, if that's how you're judging people, that's how the Heavenly Father is going to judge you. And quite succinctly, he's telling us that if our focus in regards to um, this is a problem, what we need to do is we need to move the examination away from others to ourselves. And he walks through the whole process very clearly. Either you're going to judge others or you're going to judge yourself. That's why he says, if you, why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Why are you looking at a problem that you think somebody else has when your perception's all messed up because you got this big honking beam hanging out your own eye? You can't see it. You have a distorted view of it. You're not understanding what's going on. He says, why don't you switch the examination back to yourself and maybe then you can see things clearly. 
And I think once we see things clearly, we're not even going to say something to the other person because we realize how sinful and vile and how many things we need to work on in our own lives. That's true. Amen. Amen. We got to stop being critical. Jesus says, why are you looking at your brother when you need to look at yourself? That's what we do. We have a critical spirit that can destroy both others and ourselves. And Jesus says, there's a solution. Self-examination. If you want to move from being critical, if you found yourself saying yes to any of those questions, there's a solution. Yes, amen. Check yourself. Stop thinking about other people. Don't, don't worry about in a service who this might apply to. Worry about you. Don't think about my wife causes this problem, my son causes this problem, my daughter causes this problem, whoever. No. How did I have a part in this problem? What can I do to fix this problem? And maybe the answer is you need to help somebody address sin, but primarily there's probably a part of it that lies within yourself and the blame may be at least in part yours. If you keep your hand there in Matthew chapter 7, we'll come back there in a little while, but go back to Nehemiah and chapter 7 and verses 61 and verse 62. It says this. It's going to take me a minute to explain it, but just read with me for a second. It says, And these were they which went up also from Telmilah, Tel Harisha, Cherub, Adon, and Emmer, but they could not show their father's house nor their seed whether they were of Israel. The children of Deliah, the children of Tobiah, the children of Nakoda, the 640 and 2. And so what's going on here is Nehemiah has identified this group of people. He said there's Tobiah and there's these nobles and they are causing all of these problems. They have um, engaged in this criticism. It's tearing down the city. It's causing problems. God has told him now to look to the, book, to the genealogies. And he goes through the genealogies. And in verse 62, we see that Deliah, the children of Deliah and the children of Tobiah are numbered of the people whose seed could not be identified within the children of Israel. They're not written down. They have no part within it. But what's interesting is Tobiah and Deliah are only referenced here within the book of Nehemiah and in Ezra as well, but in the same account in a different manner. There, there's another Deliah mentioned in the Bible, but he would be of the Levites, so he would be of the wrong tribe here. He would not be the one being spoken of. And so you think about that, and now we have Deliah, and if you remember last week's message, we talked about um, Nehemiah going in with Shechaniah, the son of Deliah, and Shechaniah said, why don't you stay here in the tabernacle? Because people are trying to assassinate you and he's trying to scare Nehemiah, if you all recall that. And Tobiah is the one he was working with. And now as they're going through the scrolls and they're trying to expunge from the city what needs to be expunged, we have these people who have this critical spirit who are tearing down the spirit. And as Nehemiah is going through the genealogies, Tobiah and this um, Deliah, they're not even part of it. And so what would he do? And the Bible never says this explicitly, but what they would do is they would put them out of the walls because they have no possession in Israel. They don't have the genealogy to reckon with Israel. They don't have the rights to property like the Hebrews had. And so you think about that and what do we need to do when it comes to a critical spirit? We got to put it out. You got to get it out of your life because if it stays in your life, it like a cancer is going to destroy you and we have to expel it. The second thing we must do, or the second thing we see here, is perhaps on an altogether different course, but focusing on the same verses, we see the first thing we have to do if we want to have the city and have it secure to where it can continue to grow and go is get rid of those with a critical spirit. But now you think back to these genealogies and who else Nehemiah is going to have to expel. We have the walls, they're built. We have the gates, they're up. We have the watches set. And yet, God says to meet Nehemiah, you need to check your genealogies. And we saw two of the groups that are expelled. We see Deliah and we see Tobiah and their families. Again, Tobiah was an Ammonite and yes, he married a Hebrew, but the lineage passes through the man. So his family was excluded and they're put out. And Deliah is not found at all. And so they're put out. So now we have another group though. There's one more set of seed that is found herein. All of the nobles and all of the rulers and all of the people are brought into Israel. And they're lined up and there's um, 42,000 of them that are basically found to be on these rolls. And they're going through them and they're checking people. And, yep, here you are. And yep, here you are. And we didn't read all the names. And, uh, but we have a whole bunch of the families listed here. And they're going through and this is good and that's good and that's great. And we get to verse 61. 
And then we see those who could not show their house. Again, the second half of 61 says, but they could not show their father's house, nor their seed, whether they were of Israel. And then we have Deliah and Tobiah, and we know why they're gone. But then it says the children of Nakoda, 640 and 2. And so we have 42,000 people that were found in the genealogies, and we have 642 that cannot show themselves as Hebrews. A portion of those would have been from Tobiah and Deliah. But now we have one family left, and that's the children of Nakoda. In chapter 7, though, again, look at verse 50 with me. We have here the children who are reckoned as part of Israel. We have the children of Reiah, the children of Rezin, and the children of Nakoda. So what we have going on here is we have a group of Israel, a family underneath a tribe in Israel that is reckoned, that is part of the genealogy. And yet some of them don't have their names written down. We have a group of them. The family is listed. They're a verified part of Israel. They are recorded. They are allowed. They have property. They have rights in Israel. But then there's a whole bunch more that there's nothing written down about them. There's, we see the tribe, they see where, we see where they came out of in verse 61 and 62. It tells us that these are the places that they were in bondage in in Babylon, and we know where they came from, but there's nothing recognizing who they are. And maybe it was their family, right? My mom told me I was part of this tribe. My grandma told me I was part of this tribe. Maybe they lived near some other people of this tribe of Nakoda, and they said, look, we're going to Israel. We're going to Jerusalem. Will you come with us? And they said, yeah, we'll go with you. We're... And they said, yeah, you're part of us. Come on. Well, they told me I'm part of them. We've been living with the tribe of Nakoda. We're good. We're right here. This is who we are. This is where we are. And they claim to have the right name, but all they have is a claim. There's no indication there of Israel. There's nothing more. They never took the time to examine their history. They never took the time to say, where did I really come from? Who is my family? How did I get here? What, what is the history behind the story my parent told me? And you think about that, they would have saved themselves a lot of heart and a lot, a lot of heartache and a lot of problems if they would have just examined themselves. And 2 Corinthians in chapter 13, 5 says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. I think about that and the parallel we see here is this. We have to make sure our name's written down. As believers... We need to examine ourselves. These people, they could have stood and protested in front of Nehemiah. I imagine they were saying, look, we are part of you. I, I've always been part of this family. I know what my mom told me. I know what my dad told me. I know I'm supposed to be here. I know my name's written down. And Nehemiah says, no, I have the register in front of me. I'm looking. You are not here. And so to secure the city, he has to put them out. And the truth is it's the same for all of us. There's going to be a day where we stand before God. There's going to be a time where God, our righteous judge, has everyone in the world stand in front of him, and he is going to judge out of the Lamb's book of life. Revelations 21 and 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into it any that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only way into heaven is by having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. There is no other way. Revelations 20, 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so we need to be sure. If your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, there's an eternity in judgment. There's an eternity in peril. There's an eternity of torment that we will face. A infinite number of days in a lake of fire, a place called hell, where there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth. And yet, we know that people aren't getting in. Matthew chapter 7, where I said to keep your place, if you'll flip back there with me. Matthew chapter 7, and verses 21 through 23, Jesus makes this clear. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name uh, done many wonder, wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Look what it says. It says many. Many are going to say in that day. 
There's a lot of people that think they're on their way to heaven. There's a lot of people who think they're going to be let into the gates with our Father where we get to look on the face of Jesus. But the only way to get there is through the way the Bible explains. Knowing you're a sinner, trusting in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, calling upon him as your Savior. And at that, we can have our name written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Amen. There's not going to be any, my mom told me I was saved. Like my mom told me I was coming here. It didn't work in Nehemiah's time, and it's certainly not going to work in front of our God. There's not going to be any, oh, I went to church. Not any, oh, I'm a good person. I gave away a lot of money. I helped a lot of people. I did a lot of good things. I never killed anyone. It's not going to be acceptable. Either your name is in the Lamb's book of life, or it is not. That's not you today. I'm not trying to talk anyone out of their salvation. I would never do that. But at the same time, as we're looking through these principles in Nehemiah, he says, do you want to secure your life? Do you want to know that you are ready to take an attack? You've got to look on the inside first. And yes, we've got to get a critical spirit out. But he says, you also need to make sure your name's written down. Because if your name's not written down, there's a problem. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he saith... I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in, a, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today can be the day of salvation for any of us. Amen. If that's not you today, let's heed the warning of Nehemiah. Let's look at what God is saying to us here this morning. Hey, if there's, number one, destruction in your life, if there's a critical spirit, let's get it out. But at the same time, let's take a moment and check and make sure we're saved. And if we're not, let today be the day of salvation. Good. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Perhaps you're struggling with a critical spirit. If that's you this morning, I would encourage you to come and make that right. Stop focusing on what others are doing. Just focus on yourself and build yourself and work to what he would have you to be. But then if there is one here who has never understood what it means to have your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, if there's one here who's never put their faith in Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to come to this altar and talk to someone. You can come to me and I'll talk to you right now. You can come to any one of these people in the front row. They would love to talk to you about Jesus. If that's you this morning, it would never be a time or a thing to be embarrassed about. But as we start invitation, I would encourage you to come. Let's pray and then we'll stand for a verse of invitation. Lord God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the services that you allow us to hold in your name. I thank you just for the humbling responsibility and um, ability to be able to preach to your people, Lord God. And I ask now that you would just work in our hearts and minds and help us to apply the truths that we heard this morning. If there's anyone here who is unsaved, Lord, I ask of you that you would convict them and that they would trust you this morning. Lord, if there's some of us who are struggling with a critical spirit, please help us to get it right and just to change to where we show love and examine our own selves rather than offending others. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.